Honey, I blew up the business. Welcome to the podcast. We've got Richard Jeffrey in the house. How are you doing, Rich? Great to be here. Really good to be with you, Dan, and uh, been looking forward to this for, for some time. So great to be part of it. Little intrigued to see where we're going to go with this one. The previous conversations I've had with you have gone down a number of different routes. So really, really intrigued, but I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, me too, by the way. But uh, Richard is a really great guy, and I've known him for a number of years. And we'll get into that a little bit. We've, but he's 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 full of beans, and he's got full of great experience, and and he's very humble. So he, he maybe won't admit this, but he's he's a he's had an incredible kind of career. Um, he's currently national director for GC Business. What does GC mean? The growth company. The growth company. So the growth company. Now the growth company is a not insubstantial business in based in Manchester. It's it's, a, it's, got, it's about a thousand staff. Is that right? We've got about thousand three hundred now. Going through a massive recruitment drive and uh, got about one hundred thirty million turnover. So it's quite a quite a big entity in itself. The, the growth company. So the growth company is a company that lives in Manchester that's designed to build, create, grow other companies. That's absolutely right. Yeah, we're a social enterprise and uh, we've been going for about 30 years as, as a growth company and uh, there's various bits of it. The bit that I've been uh, set up and looked after over the past 10 years was the Growth Hub, which was all about that. It's helping companies start, helping them grow, helping them scale up and really helping those leaders achieve their, their full potential. It's really, it's been a, an amazing journey uh, during that time. And now I'm looking after our national work. So really exciting times doing that. Yeah, and so that the business growth hub was something that mm. um, Richard set up and built over a ten-year period, and I'm going to get into that because there's a very interesting story there. And actually, just um, so everybody knows, Richard and I know each other because my company, the tech department, was a supplier to the business growth hub, and through, through some um, various conversations, we've built not only a kind of client supplier relationship, but I, I would say almost like a kind of collaborative element to what we've done we've, we've co-hosted events we've done a lot of kind of activity around the subject of entrepreneurship um, around mental health etc and i guess we're kind of kindred spirits in that way in terms of um, being into entrepreneurship oh, absolutely i'm really looking forward to to many of the other things that no doubt will come from this conversation as well yeah so so, so uh, uh, just to get uh, big him up a little bit more before we bring him crashing down into his kind of series of, of difficult adversities that he's had to face um not only has richard built a business from zero to 200 staff um in the business growth hub he was awarded the public and third sector director of the year award in 2018 by the institute of directors he's a fellow of the royal society of arts and he's currently an honorary industrial fellow at the university of salford and so he's got some kind of uh, a few fingers and a few pies there, sort of leading and helping the next generation. But what I'm going to start off with is just this the story about how you started Business Growth Hub, because it's, uh, it, it, the public sector in general is perhaps not known for its entrepreneurial spirit. But you're a, an extremely entrepreneurial guy that's built a, a very uh, successful business that has a public service component in there. And I'm just curious how that actually happened. So I was uh, doing a really interesting job working for the Northwest Development Agency. It was a very secure, uh, exciting job helping the Northwest of England achieve its international potential, uh, bringing investment in, helping companies export. It was a really good job, a public sector job. And before that, I'd been in private sector consultancy, so I'd been working for a whole load of global clients. And the reason I went into the public sector was that I'd been doing loads of really interesting work with a whole load of global companies, BSF, Cargill Dow, and the Japanese trading houses. Really, really interesting work. But virtually everything we were doing overseas seemed to be developing new fibers, products, solutions, building, exciting, you know, applying some really interesting kind of new new approaches. And, you know, kind of every project that seemed to be doing in the UK felt like we were closing the factory down. And it, mm. I thought there's a real disconnect here between kind of what, where I live, where I am, I'm, you know, born in the north of England, grew up in the north of England, was educated here and kind of it meant something to me and you know, kind of just getting around closing stuff down just just didn't stick well so mm. um i got involved in the whole world of economic development i believe that you can make a change that you can get 
a whole load of interventions in place that can help a place change, that can help a group of businesses and individual businesses. And there's so much good practice out there that getting that out to businesses just became something I became really, really interested in. So I was doing this, uh, moved into the public sector, really interesting, did, did some great work. But then uh, there was a, an election, uh, the coalition government came along and they closed down the development agencies overnight. So we've gone from a, a very kind of, uh, solid position to uh, a less less than solid position, but you know I, I, I was looking around at kind of what to do and got talking to uh, the folks in Greater Manchester that were running the then growth company. Said, look, come along and why don't you set up this uh, new entity that we want to set up? Something called the Business Growth Hub. And I said, well, what's that? And they said, well, we don't really know. <laughs> 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 we don't really. What we do know is that. We want to have something that's focused on growth businesses and pulls the best of public and private together to help them achieve their full potential. We want that infrastructure there. You've got a small bit of cash to get you going uh, and we'll invest in that. But you've got to set the business up. You've got to run it. You've got to build it up. Here's a couple of 18-year-olds who you can get on the phone and uh, and away you go. So we uh, so, so we, we launched it and you know we, we, we grabbed the space. And you know, one of the lessons I've learned uh, through doing it is that if you go and grab the space, build that coalition around that we're going to go and do X and get people behind it. If you grab the space, that's the key thing. You can sit there and pontificate and get it perfect and then move. And more often than not, you're too late. You've got mm. to grab the space, say you're going to grab the space and then move really quickly. And that's, that's what we did. So we had a, a big launch event with 600 people there. We had Lord's Hessel time there and say, here it is. We're going to launch a, the Growth Hub and we want to inspire others to go and do the same. And uh, meanwhile, back at the uh, back of the ranch, we had two people, two 18 year olds on the phone. And that was really? it. So it was a bit, bit of a bit of a gamble, but <laughs> I, I, I was I was pretty sure that we were going to get that space. And we were all about what well, we want this to be aspirational for businesses. We want this to be the best of public and private. We want businesses to shout about the fact that they've engaged with the hub, that they've benefited from the work. We want to get it to a stage where you've got businesses helping other businesses. We want to get it to the stage where we've got a whole room full of people who turn around and go, we wouldn't be where we are without the support. So this was the vision. This was kind of where mm. we wanted to get to. Uh, we wanted people to be uh, focused on growth, focused on investment and innovation. But of course, I was doing this in 2011. And mm. you know, back back then, there was not a lot of positivity around. And you know, some people actually laughed at me when, when I said I was going to do this. And I went to see a few organizations, see if they'd get behind. And you know, there were some that were really keen, but there was an awful lot that kind of said, look, Good luck with that, lad. And uh, <laughs> come back and come back and tell us when you've uh, when you've done something. And I think it's fair to say there was a, there was a lot of skepticism around, but we, we we kept the focus, kept growing it, building it, finding opportunities for for people to to get involved and get on board. Uh, and we built it up over time to a team of uh, uh, you know over two hundred people. Uh, we, we supported twelve thousand businesses to start grow scale, and we got some brilliant programs in place and it continues and it's gone on to influence the uh the the, the, the national network of, of growth hubs and we're still very actively involved in promoting that supporting it and and it does a lot of successes it's not been an easy journey there's been uh, a few bumps along the road uh, some big bumps on the road but 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 ultimately at the headline level we kind of set out that vision, grabbed the space, and then quickly moved mm. to make sure we've got some really good, solid things behind it. That's, that's interesting. The, the, um, the two things there, did you have that vision on in 2011? Was that, was that what you were saying yeah. to people? I, th I think we had the bulk of that vision there together, and it, there's been some changes along the way. Sure. Um, but, but fundamentally, we had that vision, and uh, we, yeah. That some of those kind of core principles we just kept coming back to, you know, the whole notion of focus on growth, focus on those businesses that have got that ambition to grow, um, focus on the, which was quite different to what had gone before, because before. Mm. So what was it before? So I think public sector kind of backed activity before had been very much focused on, look, everybody having accessibility, 
it being open to all. And we came and said, we're going to focus on those people who've got that ambition for growth, limited resources. There'd been a bit of a kind of scorched earth policy, really, on business support. It had mm. all pretty much gone. So we had mm. limited rules. So we're going to focus on those people who've got the real ambition for growth and we're going to put in services around them and we're going to bring together the best of public and private and we're going to bring together whole different streams of activity but make it really simple for the client. So, so A, they raise their ambition. B, they become aware of more opportunities and C, they then get the support from us and from their peers to, to take them through that journey. And that, that, that as a core we've had, then there's been some, some changes kind of along the way, um, particularly around moving into looking at how do we make that a bit more inclusive, but you know, mm. that, that, that was further down the line when we got yeah. to that. But yeah, Dan, I think, I think we did have some of that, that, that core vision at the start and we've kind of stuck to that and, you know, some people will call it what a clear North star, uh, and we, we did keep coming back to that, yeah. But it's, it, cause what I've, it's interesting, just as you're describing it, you've got this do where there's 600 people, the great and the good are there assembled. Yeah. And you're standing up um, with a, a, a vision and two 18-year-olds yeah. back at the office. Yeah. And, and, I, I, and what, what's Very going capable on? capable 18-year-olds. Well, I'm not dissing them. I'm not dissing them. I'm not dissing them. I'm not saying They've gone on to do great things. Yeah, you know? I, 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 and listen, and, and there's no disrespect in that at all. But there's this sort of moment in time where you kind of have a bit of a rough and tumble with the development agencies closing. You've got this new opportunity coming up. There's a bit of a, it's a bit of a um, new venture for you personally, I, I'm mm. assuming, in terms of you've not been an entrepreneur before mm. in that sense. And you've got uh, a lot of opportunity, but there's also like a lot of downside. And you're, I, right, so what was going through your mind? Because I'm assuming you gave some kind of talk or talk, said some words at your 600 person do, or you when you're stood there with your vision and your two 18 year olds, what was going through your mind? Um, uh, I don't know whether we're allowed to, to swear on these, uh, these podcasts, yes, but, get but, it uh, said. but, but I, I was thinking, <laughs> I'm really excited about this, but oh shit, how am I going to do this? <laughs> and I'd got some ideas, but there was a lot of unknowns in there. And, uh, and I was quickly kind of cobbling together. And what I was sitting there thinking was I was looking around the room saying, who can help me do this? And right. that notion of there were 600 people looking at me saying, how are you going to do it? And I switched it back out to go, no, 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 no. How are we going to do it? This is as much yours as it is what I'm trying to do here. I'm setting out a vision. We're only going to get there if everybody in the room gets on board. And some people got it and mm. came up to me and said, right, we're on board. We want to get behind this. And there's some key, key folk and key, key people who've been with us kind of all the way. Um, and, you know, I'll stupid. Uh, Steve Sangson from NatWest, he came up to me straight away. That's great. Love that vision. Love where you're going. What can we do to support, you know, mm. others, you know, and I'm going to say this, and um, we're involved in some of the universities now, but some of them a little bit less than uh, enthusiastic at the start. There were there were the naysayers, there was those who ignored us, but we started to say to everybody in the room, how can you support it? And then we built up that support and people came forward almost with their kind of, this is how we're going to support that vision. Because it's not kind of Richard Jeffrey's vision, it's kind of what at the time was Greater Manchester's vision mm. and trying to get that collective. I think that was really key to it. And, and I wasn't doing that just to kind of take the pressure off myself. I was doing it because it was the only way we could get there. And actually it was the best way I thought we'd get there. And I think that pretty much proved itself to, to be true over time. But yeah, I, I, I wasn't sitting there totally relaxed. Um, and, you know, I'd been on the, uh, on the Today programme that morning uh, where there'd been a very, very sceptical uh, interviewer uh, that morning, kind of really questioning whether this was going to be true and are businesses really going to help other businesses. And, you know, it sounds a bit, um, I can't remember his exact turn of phrase, but and I think you're saying it's a bit airy fairy, a bit light, a bit, bit, bit woolly. And, you know, and it's kind of, and it was big and ambitious, but we, we were confident we were going to get there. It's funny because now, when you sort of talk about vision and values and what have you, it's, it's everyone accepts in the world that that's a fundamental part of business or to build a business. But 20, yeah, 10 years ago, it's like, what? 
well, you know, it's a bit, it's a bit more hard edged back then, yeah. and and a bit more. So, so that skepticism. And how did you cope with the, the, that? That kind of, like they say, the naysayers, the people who are doubting, the people who are kind of you know, tripping you up. Because you've got these universities and BBC journalists being skeptical. How did you? How did that not take you down? I think it comes down to kind of learning a bit about some of your strengths in that. And I think the one thing I really learned about myself at that time was resilience. And the yes, there were a lot of people trying to knock me down, but I kind of kept getting back up because I didn't really have a choice at the time. I'd stuck my name out there. It wasn't as if I'd done this and kind of been shy about it. We'd gone for it and gone for it in a very big way, in a very big way public way you know we didn't just say oh, let's get on the bbc radio manchester we'd say let's get on the today program you know so we'd got out there so there wasn't really really a choice of of kind of letting it get me down or um letting those that that doubt creep in and you know it took us a while to start to get a bit of resources into this and we mm. kind of had to keep that that vision going that enthusiasm going and i kind of knew at the time that you know, if I started to doubt it, if I started to switch off from it, then there'd be a bit of a kind of house of cards. Of, you know, a lot of other things would, would fall over. And I think that the, the other thing I did as well, as I've sort of always done in, in my career, is just learn into some of the mentors I'd got and, and those people around me and say, look, you know, I've got this challenge, I've got this issue. And, and just having those people around you to help you do a bit of that self reflection then uh, I, th I think that was benef beneficial. Uh, but, well, I overdid it to begin with, massively overdid it, went for it far too much, worked all the time and, you know, working all weekends and all day. And, uh, you know, it kind of really hit me one day when my daughter came to me and she'd have been, oh, what, at time five or something. And she turned around to me and said, Daddy, I don't see very much of you. And, that was a real moment there. I thought, oh, okay, I'm I'm not getting this right, am I? I'm getting this very wrong, in fact. And the way she kind of looked at me, and you know, that that was pretty matter of fact. And I thought that that that's not the way I want to be living my life, and that's not a good thing. And um, you know, I kind of that that really hit me hard because uh, I grown up with just me and my dad because my mum died when I was I was two. So and I'd had a close relationship with dad, but equally my dad had been really hard working and was involved in lots of other things outside work. So I probably didn't see as much of my dad as, as I would like to have done. And therefore when my daughter said that to me, I thought, well, I'm just it's this history repeating itself. So I changed things around, changed the way I was working, changed my approach to work, and realized that I didn't have to work quite all those hours didn't have to do all of that and actually you know the world didn't fall over and things didn't fall over and actually i could dial it down a bit step back a bit let others get on and do do what they were great at doing and actually just let the thing kind of go keep the enthusiasm keep that but kind of just reassess what my role in it was so yeah that, that was quite a moment for me that and uh yeah still still feel it now when i'm talking about it really yeah well i can i, I can imagine that and it's a real paradox because you have in effect a, well a baby I, I, I spoke to lou cordwell on the podcast a, a little while ago and she was talking about when she um set up magnetic north and then had a baby and but she had now another baby still with the <laughs> The first baby and i guess it's, I, I can very much empathize with what you're saying because you, 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 one of the challenges you've got is this sort of i guess you're you're the guy that created or co-created the vision and you've stood up and said i'm going to do this and you said it on national radio <laughs> the most influential uh, sort of i guess policy maker sort of political sort of uh, platform and um, you've stuck your name on it you stuck your neck out and you've got it all riding on this thing, and it's sort of you, and you're tied up into that. And that in itself is a, a, a sort of an emotionally challenging thing to sustain. Mm -hmm. And then you've got then you kind of the, the, the price of that, you know, the, the sort of you've got this sort of because you've got to sustain this new thing, the startup, to get it going. But then you've got to balance that with your family life. And again, looking back at that time, I mean, do, do you, what do you think you learned? You know, from kind of having to carry those sort of two things, balancing that. What, what did you learn from that? 
Oh, I think oh, there's so much you learn. I think the, um, I think the, the kind of the, the biggest thing. This is going to sound a bit a bit cheesy, but um, the biggest thing I learned during that time was that I did in fact have to learn about myself. Uh, and let me let me explain a little bit more about what that means. I think I because we'd had a number of early successes, a number of early setbacks as well. I'm sure you'll uh, we'll come to those, but um, because things had gone well and i've got that drive and enthusiasm i definitely wasn't doing enough self-reflection at that time and i wasn't adapting kind of my style to different situations and different people and some people were really coming along with it some weren't and 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 uh, you know one day we uh, we got a uh, some someone who came along to support us someone who was into uh, nlp and, and a whole range of, of other other tools and, you know, psychologist and he came along to Jeffrey Lee and uh, he was pretty challenging to be honest. And, and he opened my eyes to a whole new world of tools and techniques. And, and I remember seeing some of those early ones and he made some early observations and I began to think, oh, okay, maybe this isn't such a, uh, a, a clear view of who I am. And actually let's pull some of those layers apart and underneath Maybe I'm not quite as confident as I thought. Maybe I'm not quite as resilient. Maybe maybe there's other things that I've got to work at. And, and actually, maybe I'm kind of not really thinking enough about, A, understanding myself or understanding kind of some of those other folk. And we went, we went really quite deep in, in, in some of those with the techniques. And I think, I think that's just been the start of a learning journey of kind of realising what, what's what's really getting you going forward and you know some of the tools and techniques uh, were, were were kind of pretty pretty crazy stuff and um you know look well you know that we haven't got we'd need a whole series to get into some of those but so just learning learning about what your core fear is you know there's this wonderful pro thing called the Enneagram model that just blew my mind working out what your kind of core fear is and you know, I I did quite a bit of work on that, and I'm still 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 looking at that. But you know, my kind of core core fear was that I didn't have any value to bring, that that I was unworthy, that wasn't, and and kind of that was a really weird thing for me to kind of learn that that was probably the thing that was driving me more mm. than anything. And I'm still doing work to see, see where that kind of comes from, but that manifested itself in that drive and commitment and go, go, go. And the downs, the upsides of that is you get stuff done and you can drive forward and you do all these wonderful things. Downside of that is you don't necessarily always bring everyone along with you. Uh, you don't necessarily look after yourself when you're doing that. You can drive yourself down a bit. You can ignore your family. You can, and so there's some real downsides to, to having that that bit of your um, character. So I think really learning and understanding that 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 was a massive stuff to me, and that that's a journey that I'm still kind of going down, and 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 would encourage everybody to kind of open up to, to that kind of stuff. But it's it's not easy. It's not easy some of that stuff. No, I, I agree. And in fact, it's far more difficult to do that stuff than it is to set up a company and build a company. It's far more scary. Scary. Oh, goodness, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the, the Carl Jung, the psychoanalyst, um, said that the answer to what you need is where you least want to look. Oh, absolutely. Oh, and it's yeah. true. Because you don't know who wants to go under the carpet and go, oh, hang on, I'm, I'm a, I've got a fear of... Uh, scarcity i've got a weird kind of need for acceptance i've got a, a drive for significance because i need love and i don't feel i got that as a child and these, these are the things that are really underpin all this stuff and uh, who wants to go there because that's horrible <laughs> well you know i mean you know uh, doing this this kind of work you start to look at it and and you know where i started was uh, it probably came from, I mean, goodness me, your childhood in Europe, bringing in fact, I lost my mum, and then I, I, my dad was was great in so many ways, and that drive and focus, and and you know, we're going to be positive and engaged, but we didn't do a lot of reflection on kind of what had happened. You know, grieving certainly wasn't on the the agenda mm -hmm. or anything like that. It was very much about um, kind of just get on and positivity, but in that. 
you know, the words kind of feelings and talking about some of those language, that didn't feature a great deal. And mm. I remember, you know, around this time, my wife asked me how I felt about something. And I didn't really have that language to respond really? to that. Mm. <laughs> so starting to unpick that and starting to get some of these kind of what gets a bit of a warm feeling and an uncomfortable feeling and getting comfortable with leaning into that, getting comfortable with saying, I feel really uneasy about X or I feel really uneasy about that or there's something there that's not quite right. I'm ignoring it by either working really hard or working hard and then, you know, going out or whatever and being dead busy all the time and doing, you know, loads of other stuff and right, we're finished. Now I'm going to go for a 10K run. Now I'm going to do this. There's probably something you're ignoring there. And having that bit of time to kind of reflect and lean in is, is, is key. Yeah. Um, but but it's it's not easy. But but there is support. There is tools. There's loads of stuff to do to, to help you with that. I think you, uh, I remember when I did start to do that. Some of the folk that perhaps not been bringing along, not not engaged. You know, even some of them started to recognise some of the changes in myself that I was just that little bit more kind of dialed down, that little less intense. Uh, I mean, some people are probably laughing listening to this, but <laughs> but, but 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 still, there was a learning. But but it's an ongoing journey, you know. Uh, yeah, we were all works in progress, and and uh, what's interesting, and really, I think um, brave and good of you is to to actually go there and talk about that because i think one of the things that, that's a, again it's a bit of a paradox for entrepreneurs is you you sort of almost need that drive to get the thing started and to stand mm-hmm. on that stage and to go on that radio show and be that person and have that vision and that belief but then at a certain point it starts to act as a corrosive element in you is because that drive then becomes counterproductive because you're driving yourself too much there's, there's too much volume of things to yep. do to think about to be to, to be part of and, and by the way i know that because that was and has been me for mm-hmm. years and i have a pattern a repeated pattern where this happens where i'm all you're describing about running exercise this that doing a podcast doing i'm always doing stuff and i sometimes find it quite difficult to just be yeah absolutely uh, so, so now by the way workaholism is a form of addiction yeah, and, and what is an addiction? And, and I, 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 close listeners to the podcast may have heard me speak about a chap called Gabor Mate mm. before. Gabor Mate is a, a, a physician, a doctor, but he's an expert on addiction. And he talks about this, about workaholism being addi- an addiction. And an addiction is a, a way of masking pain. Because if you're working and your adrenaline's pumping and you're on a deadline, you're being fed brain chemicals that are keeping you kind of high and distracted from the thing that's really bugging you, right? You, you said this, the thing that's, that's under the surface. And when you're quiet and you're not on Twitter and you're not watching Netflix and you're not on a deadline and you're not checking Slack, these little things under the carpet start coming out. And, and they come out, yeah. Yeah, you wake up at night and they're there, don't you? <laughs> and you feel, you feel uncomfortable about that, so you want to run away from it. And But being aware of that, which is what you're talking about, is, I mean, for me personally, this is what's been helping me um, get out of, of, of burnout and depression to have a much better work-life balance, to have a better relationship with my wife and kids is to actually go inside and open up and actually sit with these feelings, these emotions, and actually be able to acknowledge them. Like you say, like sometimes you don't even know what it is or you're not feeling it. I think there is a, a, a dilemma here there, Dan, isn't it? Because it's great to say when you've done something and had this learning, but if you still look at the kind of infrastructure that's around about when you wanted to get a business off the ground, when you're pitching to angels, investors, and build, there's still a bit of that mentality, you, you've got to give it all. You look at the language around it, you look at what's expected. So I think you know, there'll be those listening who say, well, that's all very well. You guys have gone and done some stuff. And then, yeah, but, but, and it's easy for you to sit there and say that. Um, but, but actually you, you went and did that and you got that result. Well, don't we have to go and do that and get that result? And I think that's a really big challenge because mm-hmm. I think the structure's still there and that, that whole kind of blitz growth mentality growth at all costs and that that was a really big driver uh, i think it's changing i think it's changing but but still if you look at so many of those mega successful companies that's been very much part of their their kind of ethos i yeah. don't think it's something that kind of stacks up anymore though uh for, for a whole load of reasons and i think the just 
growth for growth's sake uh, isn't enough. And it's not giving kind of anybody enough from that, you know, from be it staff, be it leaders, be it increasingly investors starting to look at a broader range of things they want to look at. Um, and that whole world of, of inclusive growth coming in. And, you know, that, 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 that's a really interesting story. And it's a right some of those transitions. And you know, we've had, we've had this growth. And I'm, I'm sitting here at the minute um, in Manchester and I'm looking out and I can see the skyscrapers. And there's a lot of skyscrapers and a lot of growth and a lot of wealth and a lot of growth. I'm looking at some of the house prices around South Manchester and what's happened there. And hey, it all feels good. You know, it's all going to happen. But there's a whole lot of people who've not been part of that growth. Mm. A lot of people not been part of that growth. And we've got to look at that because it's just not going to be sustainable if, if, if we don't, you know. Uh, and, you know, there, there was, we talk about those kind of pivot moments and there's perhaps one of the biggest pivot moments that we had when we were, or, or, or kind of inflection at moments when we're developing the growth that was really kind of a shift from the story of, you know, when I've really only asked how many jobs have you helped companies create? That that was really the main kind of question too. Uh, and it was probably around the time, you know, when, when Andy Burnham joined, the narrative started to shift to, okay, but are those good jobs? Where are those jobs? And who's getting those jobs? And that's a really interesting set of questions that you've got to ask yourself around, okay, where is growth taking place? How do you make sure we've got some routes for people to get into those jobs? How do we make sure that everyone's benefiting from that? And I think think we've got a long way to go with that. The whole, I mean, in essence, that kind of, dare I say it, the levelling up agenda is kind of aligned to that. But I think there's some really good, solid, practical things we can do to, to enable that to happen. Well, this actually brings me to a couple of points that I think is, uh, I wanted to talk to you about. This, this idea of the kind of macro view mm. of the economy and society that you have. And then you also have this micro view of oh, you are an entrepreneur and you have been built a business and you you have been you know facing be it uh, cash flow or or, or, or mm-hmm. staff or what have you, you so you you have you're kind of a, a, an entrepreneur that makes other entrepreneurs. You have this policy view of the world, and so how is that um, sort of bigger picture? Um, now you talked about inclusive growth there, but obviously there's a pandemic that's come into the mix. So, so how is your big picture view of the world? Um, uh, where is that now? So I think we we come out of the pandemic and. It's great that we're focusing again on growth and activities and lots of events taking place, and gigs starting again, and and the, the, the nighttime economy building up. There's a lot of positives in there, but I think fundamentally what it showed is just those massive divides in society. And some of the problems that we had before the pandemic are here now and probably bigger because where are the professions that have really kind of suffered during this? It's, it's you know, the, the problems around kind of social care, the, 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 the lack of security around some of the hospitality and leisure, uh, the, the, the challenge you've got with some of those retail businesses that are going through massive change. And so I think, I think the big kind of thing to look at now is, um, we, he, it's all very well saying, great, look, there's lots of changes, lots of opportunities. You know, w- w- one of the, the programs that we set up and, and I love is, is our global scale-up program, hoping those scale-up companies tap into global markets. And I look at those companies and they've done amazingly well during the pandemic because they didn't go, oh, I can't get on a plane. Let's put it off for a year. They went, right, how am I going to do it differently? Right. Who do I need to speak to, Richard? Who can you put me in touch with? How am I going to get into that market? And some businesses who've now expanded globally without getting on a plane and operating in multiple markets doing incredible. They've done well, really well, and will continue. Well, there's a whole load of other folk that are just far too far away from that and what those companies need. And I think I think the emphasis has to be starting to get it so that, the, you know, that, you know, school kid in, be it on the outskirts of, you know, Oldham or, or Bolton or Wigan, feels 
as though they're part of this growth and feels that though they can be part of that and have a pathway to it. And that needs a, a lot of work. And that's that's a whole kind of system approach that needs to be taken because there's no one simple solution to that because part of it's around belief, part of it's around access to, to those businesses. And, you know, Sharon, if you've got three engagements with businesses as you're going through your kind of school life, you're much more likely to get a job, much more likely to be successful. And, and so trying to get more of those connections, I think is going to be key, but that's part of it. Then there's the, the school systems. There's a whole infrastructure piece to look at, but part of it's that belief and can I do it? And is there a pathway that I can see for myself into that? So I think big divide, big, big divide. And I need to really try and plug some of those gaps and, and I need to really kind of focus in, not just on the whole growth international important though that is critical critical because if you don't create the opportunities you don't got anything to play with create those opportunities but be mindful of the place in which you are and and i've seen a big change i think in businesses over the past year and a half and yeah you've seen a lot more companies looking at employee ownership models a lot more business leaders saying do you know what actually i know i was going for that ipo but, but, but actually i want a bit more of a legacy here and I've got this purpose that I talk about, but I can only really achieve that and have that longevity if I look at employee ownership. So some people have gone down that. I think a lot of firms have looked really carefully about that broader aspects of inclusivity from the type of people they're bringing in and recognizing that, you know, there's, there's, there's gender, there's race, but there's everything else, neurodiversity, you're starting to see stuff in firms that you just wouldn't have seen five, 10 years ago, just, you know, uh, uh, seminars on um, a whole range of topics on what it's like, you know, parenting and recognizing the different stages of parenting. And those businesses that get that feel more inclusive, are more inclusive, actually attract people in and they're the ones that I think are going to do well. So I think, mm -hmm. I think we're, I think a lot's changed actually in the last year and a half. And I think you're seeing a whole load of new business folk coming through that have got that mentality and realize that actually they have got a bigger role to play than just achieving that growth and just mm. fulfilling their core investors that have got a much broader set of stakeholders to engage with. Look, it's not everyone. There's still loads of businesses out there that go, well, nothing to do with you. <laughs> um, but, 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 but even some of those businesses, you start to see some cracks appear and go, actually, actually, that feels pretty good doing that. And, oh, hey, hang on a minute. I'm keeping people. The turnover's dropping. And hey, um, I'm, I'm actually getting a bit more customer loyalty. And people are saying really nice things on this on, on, on social media. And oh, that, that feels good. And I've got a bit of money in my pocket. So, so there's that. And then the, the, the other big, big shift has been a much greater awareness around um, the need to, to be part of the low carbon story and be part of that um, climate change and recognising that that you've got a big role to play as a business in, in in tackling that. And again, companies from all walks, the big energy firms, they're all at it, of course, the big energy users, but, but equally in service firms, your, your small and medium-sized manufacturers, increasingly recognising actually I need to get on this low carbon journey and I need to start to make some of the shifts. So, so there's that, some of the big things, uh, Dan, that I'm seeing in, mm -hmm. in terms of, in terms of how that changes. And, and I think that a lot of that is whilst it's been really, really tough for a lot of businesses, I'm kind of quite heartened to see some of those changes. And I think there's a big drive now to kind of make sure those things kind of have, uh, a sustain it, become part of the new norm. Mm. And that, that's going to be a big challenge, I think, for, for everybody. But, but I'm really hopeful about what, what, what can come from here. Yeah, I, 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 I'm hopeful too, actually. And for what it's worth, I, I, obviously I'm speaking to a lot of entrepreneurs on this podcast and a recurring theme has been, I call it an awakening to uh, call it purpose or an ethical framework or grounding or a sense of, of, of connectedness to the, the, the team or the customer. And, and you mentioned low carbon, uh, things like that. <laughs> People are investing in creating new products, new services that are, are designed to help uh, encourage that. And what, what's interesting is this sort of an eth when you talk about inclusive growth, I guess this is, it's growth, but with the, the ethical component there. So it's not purely about making money. It's about making money in, in a particular kind of way. Yeah, I, th I think it is about making money in particular, but, but it's also, I think, it's 
it, it you know, let, let's let's be clear. There's still a strong link to making money because, to, to, you know, if you're going to run a successful business now, you've got to have access to the very very best staff, and there is skill shortages we've seen. You're mm-hmm. only going to get those staff if you are of a you know, purpose is definitely a big driver of people. People mm-hmm. want to know what are you doing on low carbon. You know, people want to know about what's your flexibility here. People want to know about what you're doing about development of them as individuals. They want to know about what your uh, equality, diversity and, and inclusion policy is. They want to see that. And if you haven't got those things front and center of your business, it's going to be really hard, I think, to, to, to run a successful business because I don't think you're going to get the staff. I don't think... You're going to keep your customers, and I think I think it's fundamental, more fundamental to mm-hmm. rather than I'm going to make a bit of money and do these things on the side. I think it becomes much more uh, central because I think ultimately a lot of these things are driven by by consumers. I think as consumers are getting more aware of their choices, and and it, it's a pathway we're on here, and, and I get that. But as they get more aware, and they, uh, you know, some of these topics become more embedded in our day-to-day way of talking and thinking businesses have to respond to that and the successful ones will and you know again it's it's 10 years into what i've been doing reflecting on it and if i look back to kind of 2011 the businesses that were successful then were those that kind of got on this notion of okay we've had this massive financial crisis everyone's telling me i can't get cash but actually, we've got this guy, Richard, and his team here saying there's loads of other ways to get money into my business. Mm. And actually, I'm going to try and I'm going to build and actually I've got a vision and I'm going to go for it. And those businesses that kind of had that positive mindset of you can do growth then in the same way now, that's the same story now, but, mm. I, can do growth, but I can do it in a sustainable way that's going to enrich not just my business, not just me, but those around me, and that all of those things are kind of circular and intertwined, that you've got to get all of that if you want to make it stack up. Um, and, and, you know, sure, you're going to feel better about it, but it's just going to have a better business at the end of it. I agree. And I think there's this really something there that this sustainability of your business, uh, the profitability of it, that you're ha- attracting, retaining staff is a great case in point. It's a competitive advantage if you can get this stuff right. Uh, we had a good chap on the podcast, um, a guy called Mark Stringer, who talked about how, how he was really proud of his business because he was kind. He's a kind place to be. And I thought, yeah, isn't that beautiful? Like he's built a business where people are kind to each other. And, and that is something that's qualitatively possibly more important as long as you're getting paid, you know, broadly the right kind of rate, that, what's, that's what's going to keep you somewhere and get you to put that extra effort in as an employee. And as an employer, it's just a better place to be. And, and, and actually just to pick up on something, just to tie perhaps this macro down to the very, very personal, you, you talked about learning about yourself and how important that was for you. And in a way, I'm thinking here that what sometimes can get lost here in the sort of bigger view of values and purpose and, 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 and ethics and what have you is actually you need to be ethical to yourself. As you're talking here, I'm like, you need to be kind to yourself and look after yourself and support and nurture yourself as well as your team and your company and your investors or whatever. I think one of the things that just I, I, as you're talking, I, I'm thinking, yeah, what I've learned is to be kinder to myself. And that makes me more commercially viable because I'm not beating myself up, working so hard and then burning out. I'm sustainable over time. So, so you could argue there's a sort of psychological kind of individual thing here for you, the entrepreneur. And that can then, once you're at peace with yourself and more connected to yourself, that propagates out to everything around you. And then you are that change maker. I think, I think that's really true, Dan. And uh, I think there's a lesson there. And I think that that's a really big reflection that you, you're right, being kind to yourself, celebrating those successes, but equally not being floored by when things don't go well. So, you know, there's been a number of big contracts along the way that, that we haven't got. And in the moment, you feel devastated and you think this is it. Why haven't we got that? We would pinned a lot of hopes on that. And there's been a number of those along the way. But equally, every time we haven't got one of those, it's kind of forced us to do something different that's actually been better for us in the longer term, more diverse income, different. And, and actually having that learning and just kind of saying, yeah, sure, of course you want to win stuff. Of course you want to get stuff. But when you don't, it's not the end game. It's actually, that's just see it as a learning process 
And that in itself is kind of being kind to yourself. And I think you've just got to keep reminding yourself of that and reaching out to your peers, reaching out to others to, 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 to recognize that actually there's a lot of people out there who will remind you to be kind to yourself and will be kind to you. And mm-hmm. actually the one thing I, I, I've taken from had this amazing experience working with all these entrepreneurs is just how kind they can be and how much they do want to support one another during this process. Mm. Uh, and that's been really uplifting and continues to be. And it's, it's not the perception actually, I think out there of what a lot of entrepreneurs are like, but what for, from my learning is there's an awful lot of desire to want to help one another. Uh, sure. Because you're going to get some benefit from it, but equally just because it's a great thing to do. Yeah, I think that's spot on. And I think it's interesting here. I think one of the things, by the way, I think you are very good at is this being open, actually sharing. And you mentioned earlier about speaking to your mentors, uh, mentors and, and, and sharing and getting that feedback and, 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 and when you're kind of, you know, in the rough and tumble. And actually, this is the one of the ways I remembered as, as I was coming into this interview that we built our relationship was, mm-hmm. um, you came to me and, and I was a supplier to your business and we didn't really know each other very well. And you said, Hey, Dan, uh, you're a tech guy. You, you do tech stuff. I, I need Need to know more about tech, could you let? Can you help me with that? And and that's not quite a rare thing to do for a guy running a business to go talk to someone and just say, "Look, I don't know about this." To make yourself vulnerable in that way, and and then really, what was beautiful about that was it was like, "Yeah, of course, I'm going to help you." And we and it sparked yeah. a whole series of conversations and, and introducing people to network and events and all that, like we've mentioned earlier. But had you not had the the courage and wisdom, perhaps to to be that open, and, and uh, it wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have flowered. And mm-hmm. you're kind of saying that there. I think there's something that I think let's just focus on this for a second. The openness to just say, "I don't know." To, to be to, to have that courage to to be vulnerable, I think that the, the reciprocation you get from other entrepreneurs and people in your network does happen. But it does require to get over your kind of fear. You talk about fear, innate fears, but that's I think a lot of fears people have fears of being judged or criticised or, or what have you. So I think there's there's a real lesson in there. And, and I wouldn't have done that, I don't think, ten years ago because I was all bullish and go and mm. we know all of this and we can do all of this. But along the you've got to recognise that that things change pretty rapidly and there's always going to be something new out there. And you've just got to admit to yourself sometimes that you don't really understand it or don't know about it. And and if kind of put your hand up and go, need a bit of help here, be it from your team, be it from your partners around you, be it from your mentors, that what are you going to get from that? Well, the vast majority of people are going to say, yeah, sure. I'll help. And here's some thoughts. Mm. And, have you read this? Have you looked at that? And more often than not, in fact, almost always, people do lean in and support you if you open that up. And actually, people respect you for doing it. And I think, you know, it, it's look, all the conversations that have opened up from, from me reaching out to you and saying, I don't really understand. And, and I understand a lot more now. Don't get it all. Still going through a learning curve. Oh, yeah. but, but, but I think it's really important to do that. Yeah. No, it's, it's a great uh, takeaway that, and, and so we're edging towards the end of our sort of podcast time. And it's, it's, so thank you, Richard. Again, you're so full of like great, great information in there. And I think this whole there's so many themes in there that are important for entrepreneurs, and particularly around this idea of connecting to yourself, opening yourself up, being building that kind of group of people around you who can help you kind of in the rough and tumble. But one question I like to ask people on this podcast before just to finish up is, and um, what. There's lots, so there's always advice, and we're providing lots of wisdom on this podcast. <laughs> but uh, what advice should entrepreneurs ignore? I think, you know, on one level, and this is going to sound really odd for a guy whose role it is to provide business support and advice. And, and in many ways, I'm going to say ignore kind of everything. Um, but but that, that's a bit of a flipping statement. What, <laughs> what I mean by that is, look, ultimately, there's – Lots of different people with lots of different experiences. Learn from as many as you can, but make sure you come back to yourself and you're reflecting on what they're saying. But ultimately, you've got to make some of those calls. You've got to be be, be honest to that and have that inner confidence sometimes that you can go and do that. And I think it's you know there's a spectrum here. Isn't there? One end, there's that Richard Jeffrey standing on the stage saying, "I know a thing. We're going to go and do this," you know. Other times as those where it perhaps been a bit too, you know, awkward to me, I don't know, and reaching out. And I think there's that 
place in between where having that self-confidence, sure, lean in and get advice and guidance and others, but there's lots of different stuff out there, but ultimately getting variety, but then becoming central to, to, to where you are, uh, being open to it, but, but coming back to who you are and what you want to do and, the, you know, focusing on that, that end goal and the be people who say you can, people who say you can't, people who say you can lean in and just say, well, what, what am I going to, what am I going to do well and badly at? Uh, think people who say you're never going to get there. Well, why? And lean into that and, and get that from that and pull them out. So to an extent, you know, I, I, I'd say take it all with a bit of a pinch of salt because ultimately you've got to come back to, to where you are. But there is some really good guidance out there. So don't ignore it, but kind of just filter it and make sure it works for you. That's great. Great advice from someone who's been there, done it, and advised <laughs> other people on it and is continuing to take that and scale it around the UK and, and the world. Uh, thank you so much for sharing so openly. Um, from behalf of me and, and all our listeners, Richard, thank you so much. And hopefully I'll see you soon in real life. Well, I hope so, yeah. It's been, it's been really great. I've really enjoyed that, that conversation. And look, you know, there's the, the, the one thing takeaway from this is there is loads of support out there for people, be that through your hubs, through your peer networks. There's a whole load of stuff out there and do lean into it because you get a lot out of it. So, so where, where's the best place to connect with you uh, on the internet? Where, where should people look you up? Oh, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Look at me on LinkedIn. And uh, I, I'm there. And uh, uh, I think also lean into the, the growth of network and lean into to, to some of your local networks that are out there as well. But if you, if you, you find me there on, on LinkedIn and uh, under Richard Jeffrey and uh, uh, GC Business, and that's where you find me. So, yeah, lean in if you want to have any other conversations or one of the connections, really, really keen to, to meet people. And doing the new national role that I'm doing now, I've met some amazing folk already. So, mm. yeah, really exciting. Amazing. Well, well I'm, I'm absolutely positive it'll go from strength to strength and again thank you again and check him out richard jeffrey on linkedin and uh, other platforms too i'm sure but like uh i'll i'll, I'll see you all next time thanks ever so much richard and i'll uh, i'll see you see you on the other side great great to see you dan do you want to get the top five tip bits from each episode emailed to your inbox every friday yes you do it saves you having to go through and make notes and make a note of all the books and all the ideas that are in the podcast. We go through and we choose the top five we like, plus put all the links into that email. So if you just go up to honeyibluupthebusiness.com, yes, that's honeyibluupthebusiness.com, and just enter your email address. There's a little box. Just enter it in, and we will send you that information. And it saves you having to make notes and all that. That's uh, make your life a bit easier. And, of course, if you did enjoy the episode, please consider subscribing. We are trying to help people through this. So the more people that subscribe, review, rate on Apple, Google, Podcasts, Spotify, the more people will see it and the more we can help. So help us help other people, other entrepreneurs like you. And before I go, I've got to say big up to my company, the tech department, the company we blew up and put back together again. They're generously supporting me on this mission through the podcast. So if you guys want to have a look at a company that can really help you improve your technology, make it better so your business gets better to boosting your sales and your profit and a bit more sanity in your life, a little less stress, then head up to the techdept.com, the tech department, uh, my company. Uh, give us a look. On behalf of all of us here, thank you for listening. and I'll see you next time.